Peace, y'all. It's your girl and favorite edible activist, Melissa L. Jones, um, tuning in. So excited to be here. Um, I am happy Monday, like for real. I hope y'all had a really great weekend. Um, but yeah, I'm just super excited to have another episode on live. This is the third live episode. So I am celebrating every single milestone. OK, let me just put that out there. Um, I have some things in the chat. As you all join, um, welcome to tonight's um, live episode here on YouTube. Um, Lita, shout out. Thanks, thank you for making it. Um, but you're not going to leave us hanging. You're not going to leave me hanging. So I need you to drop into the chat where you're tuning in from. Um, shout out your city. Say hello. And if you are an Edible Activist alum, like salute. Thank you for showing up and showing up for your girl. Um, so... Here we are. New episode. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, Mel. I love when people call me Mel. Uh, welcome, y'all. So we're going to we're going to get started. I'm not going to take up too much time because I value you all's time. Um, but again, um, I am your girl, Melissa L. Jones um, of the Edible Activist podcast, your fav your very favorite edible activist. And for tonight's show, we actually have a little bit of a change. Um, we were going to have another guest on the show um, to talk about a really like amazing um, project and an issue that she had been working on um, in regards to um, reparations and this whole project she had built. I got to send love to Kamari. Um, not feeling great today, but I have a backup guest and I'm excited because I feel like he's going to be talking to me the entire time for my soul. But we're going to have a conversation around growing food in tiny spaces. Um, if you are city living like myself, I'm in D.C., or even if you're not living in the city, maybe you have a very tiny space or you do not have access to land, we are going to talk about growing food inside of your tiny space. Um, the rent high. The groceries are high. Everything is expensive, okay? And I don't know what is going on out in this world, recession, what have you. We don't know, but we got to start growing some food, okay? But it is that question of like, but Mel, I don't have access to land or I don't live in a house. I don't have a front yard or a side yard. But listen, my homie said, if you got a window, if you have sunlight and some pots, you got some food. So I hope y'all are very excited about this episode. I am. And I'm just going to look in my chat real quick. Okay, Austin. Hey, Boston. We got Boston in the house. Hey, Ray. Hey there. Um, and Marilyn, my sister's in the building too. Shout out. All right, y'all. So again, we're going to be talking about growing food in tiny spaces. So if you have a tiny space, and again, if you don't have access to land, but you want to grow some food and you want to feel empowered to do something, this is the episode for you, okay? So without further ado, and again, y'all know me, give me a moment because I'm back here just multitasking, which I don't like to multitask, um, but I'm going to bring on our guest for today. Um, without further ado, Chris Riddick of Afro Beats. What up? We can't hear you. No, but while you're getting that together, let me intro go. Chris. There he goes. So Chris is the founder and creator of Afro Beats, which is an amazing platform. But most importantly, like he is my homie and he's my friend. He has been on this, been on the show several times. He has helped me to co-host Edible Activists before pandemic, even actually some during the pandemic. We linked up and we did we did some things. Um, but definitely a friend in this space. And I'm always, if you guys are consistent listeners, I am always shouting out Chris because every time we have a conversation around growing food and what we don't have access to, I'm always like, well, Chris said, as long as you have X, Y, and Z, you can grow food. I'm always referencing Chris and Afro Beats. Um, Chris's platform is just really amazing because he just displays like all the foods of the, of the diaspora, but in this very like colorful and rich way. And um, a lot of his stuff, it's more so primarily like plant-based, vegan, but really just like showca showcasing the colors of nature, of our food, of our food, right? Of our food system. Um, so Chris, I'm so excited to have you and you're gonna help me and you're gonna help our audience tonight. All right, because some of us are struggling, okay? I got you, I got you. Thank you, first of all, for having me. You know, I, I call you big sis for a reason. We've been in this thing for a little bit now, and every time we talk, I, it's always a joy. So thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, 
this is how this is going to work, y'all. So I'm going to talk to Chris. I'm going to see what y'all got going on in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them as we're going along. Um, but this is going to be a dialogue. This is going to be a conversation, right? So, um, Chris, the groceries are high. All yes, right. Very high. I was telling you that I was in Costco out of town one weekend and I saw that they were selling spam and it scared me because I said, where's this world really going when you see spam at Costco? All right. No, if y'all eat spam, like no judgment. Okay. But I'm just saying, <laughs> but there's a lot happening and we have, you know, you have been a big, very big advocate and a firm believer on that. I, in that it doesn't matter how small your space is that you can grow some food. Right. And Absolutely. so, I really want our listeners and viewers to walk away with like four key things that they need to start growing food. I think the biggest one is the confidence, <laughs> right? And the will yeah. to be like, I can do this because I've seen someone else do it, you know, or I know of other people doing it. But, you know, I'm city living, you're city living, you know, we have these yeah. tiny spaces and I just want to grow a tomato. I said that with a D. Tomato. Okay. <laughs> a tomato. So talk to us. Like, first of all, give a very brief, very brief intro. If y'all want to learn more about Chris, go back to my episodes. This ain't going to be the episode to learn all about Chris. We're going to, these are going to be some real resources because if you guys have tiny spaces or if not, maybe if you are working with a little bit of land, even if it is a small space, like, you know, we want you all to walk away just feeling confident and empowered that you can grow something. And this is also a lesson for me because I need to get up on it. So anyway, are you Chris? Yeah. So uh, my name is Christian Riddick. I'm a garden to table educator. I basically connect people of the African diaspora back to the land. I'm really passionate about people growing their own cultural foods and understanding that uh, you don't have to rely on the system that we're currently in. You know, you can grow at home and no matter what space you have, I just say, as long as you have the heart to grow, you can find a way to grow. And I'm a testament of that. You know, I didn't grow up in a farmer family. I've lived in like suburbs and cities most of my life. So um, me, it was just a trial and error and I figured it out. And I hope I can give you guys some good tips today to help you figure it out as well. Awesome. Well, you will, you will. Because uh, <laughs> I have confidence in you. So, Chris, so I have a tiny space and mm -hmm. I have a window. Um, and though my father's like, you need to put curtains up. I didn't want to put curtains up because I really like natural lighting. But I get where he's coming from. Right. Especially yeah. as, you know, a female living in it. Like, I understand. But um, I want to grow food. I want to feel empowered to grow food or to grow something. And so obviously, you know, there are the questions of, well, you know, I can grow some, but not enough, right? So if, if like, if stuff goes down tomorrow, you know, like, will yeah. it be enough supply? Can I grow enough in my tiny space? But we just need to start. Yeah. So where, where am I starting? Where are we starting? Where is the person with the tiny apartment who's mm -hmm. like seeing all these like, badass growers like i just want to just start so where where are we starting well the first place to start is wherever you're getting light so wherever that is for you if that's a, a window if that's uh, outside on a balcony if that's the rooftop of your garden that's where you start figure out where can i get the most light and where do i actually have space to get things going um this kind of brings me to the first place you can grow which is your window um and it can be paired with grow lights or it can't depending on how much light you get um, you typically want a southwest or type facing window to maximize light and actually to be able to grow food. Um, if you have that, you have to figure out how much of that light you're getting. So if you're growing something like herbs or leafy greens, you might be able to get away with three to six hours of sunlight. But if you're growing something like a tomato or like an eggplant in your window, you're probably going to need six plus, more like eight hours of sunlight. So kind of measuring that and also being cognizant of the fact that when you're growing food indoors and next to a window, if you're doing it inside your window and inside your home, it's always going to be filter light. It's not going to be the same thing as it being outside, but you can still mm -hmm. do a lot with that. Yeah. All right. So what do I need to buy? What am I buying? Or what, yeah. or what do I need to buy and or what do I look for first in my home 
before to going out to buy a ton do. of stuff because y'all are creative. Y'all <laughs> growers are creative, like literally. Man, I tell you, I'm growing in a little bit of everything. Honestly, as long as something has uh, drainage holes in it and it can hold water, then you're pretty much good to go. I've grown in uh, containers, storage containers. I've grown in the buckets you get from Home Depot. Um, I've grown in little pots. I've grown in window boxes. So it really depends on what you're trying to grow and how much space that plant needs. So for instance, if you're growing something like a tomato plant, you're going to need at least five gallons of the soil to maximize that, that harvest. But if you're growing herbs, you might only need like a gallon of soil. So something that can hold anywhere from a gallon to five gallons plus is probably what you're looking for. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Like I said, it depends on the space. I find that the garden boxes that kind of hang on the balconies also do well in a window. A lot of the uh, clearances from the window to like the edge is about four feet, which is about the size of most garden boxes. Not four feet, four inches. Yeah. So, and they kind of just like, is there, how do they attach? Do they kind of just to like the, sit To the on balcony or, or to... Yeah. Well, if you're doing it in your window, you can just sit it on the ledge as long as you have enough space. But if you're doing a balcony, you can buy these hooks um, like off of Amazon. They're real cheap. I think they're like two or three dollars and you can hook them onto your back balcony. And even if you have like a really wide uh, kind of like balcony ledge or a really thin one, they have the ones that you can actually like adjust to the size of your balcony. OK, got it. I hope you all heard that. So there's a question, um, Chris. How do yeah. we know which way is southwest? Good question. Uh, so one is figure out where the sun is first. And uh, the sun uh, rises in the west, right? Sets in the east. Um, so if kind you're of, asking me, I don't have an answer. For that. <laughs> I, think, I think that's right. I think that's right. So whatever basically, you said. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you find out where the sun is. And I can also send resources, too, on this. You find out where the sun is uh, based off of where your window is. And so if it's kind of like, where is it after kind of midday? Because you don't want something that has a bunch of sun in the morning and then like no sun at night, um, because that is a shorter period of time on when you actually get the sun. So wherever your, your uh, window goes to, whatever part of your house is the most light at the end of the day, that's probably where your southwest facing window is. Uh, if you get a lot of light in the morning in that window, that means it's probably a north or east facing window. Okay, so Ray Rise helped us out. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, rises in the east, sets in the west. Yes. So that that kind of that shows my point. So if it rises in the east and then it uh, sets in the west, in the morning, the east facing window is going to get more light. In the afternoon, the west facing window is uh, going to get more light. So think about that after. That's an easy way if you don't want to say, okay, where am I east? Late? So wherever your light is more in the afternoon, that's where you can start. I mean, because it sound, almost sounds like I just need to like stand outside for like a few hours and just like really figure this out before yeah. I start <laughs> planning stuff. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, always get the, I always get the directions to confuse, but yes. Okay, so Ray, and I hope Rise I'm pronouncing your name right. Is it Rye or Ray? Rye, Ray. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. right. Use that's the, the one from compass. The, that's that Boston education right there. Yes, use the yeah. compass <laughs> in your GPS or mobile phone too. <laughs> <laughs> that's We're a good way to have you on the show next time. <laughs> yeah, there, there are apps for that. There's also other tricks where you can put like a stick in the ground and like figure out there's compasses and stuff like that. But, you know. I mean, you like what were our ancestors doing before we had all these applications, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. And she's from Philly. <laughs> okay. Philly education. I like it. There go. <laughs> I know that's right, right? You better rep yourself. I just live in Boston. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Philly in the building. That's what's up. That's what's up. So let's talk about some of the things that you have. And again, Chris, this is Chris Riddick of Afro Beats. He has an amazing um, platform that really, you know, displays the colors of the diaspora um, when it comes to food. He really gives a lot of tips on um, growing food and is a proponent for growing food in tiny spaces. 
Um, I remember when I first met Chris, um, who is an edible activist alum, um, he's really always pushed home. You know, it doesn't matter how big or small your space is. Everyone has the ability to grow something. Um, Chris, you and I were having a conversation, you know, before we got the show started and just saying how, you know, the food system is already jacked. It's been bad and how it's just it's it's getting worse. And so I do feel like, too, you know, because social media does this and TV does this, that there's um, a lot of fear that's being placed um, Mm -hmm. into our minds right now. And and just just out. It's just we're just it's just being injected out to us. And so one of the biggest conversations has been around food and food shortages. Right. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, in real time, I, I try I try to laugh at a lot of things. This, this world is ve- feels very weird to me, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, but just hearing about what's going on in the world and like the food shortages, I you know, one of my biggest things is I want everyone to walk away feeling empowered that they can do something in this space. Uh, but lo and behold, like goodness, like if we are really. Um, if, if, and this is if we choose to believe this, right? Because I also have like my, my other thoughts and opinions around food shortages because there's, there's an abundance of food, right? There is. Um, but has any of that been even more of a catalyst for, you know, growing more, you know, taking ownership, being more empowered, to, to, to grow more and to utilize every corner, every resource that you have to, to grow food um, because of the way that our economy is right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was doing it before the economy started really getting bad and we're at where we are right now, but it's just crazy. The price is what you paid for, you know, a carrot last year or avocado just a few years ago is not the same price that you're paying today, the price has gone up big time. One, because we're still feeling the effects of COVID. COVID not only disrupted our lives, but it disrupted the supply chain. We realized how fragile our food system really is when we couldn't get fresh veggies and things like that. You know, when you were out there, you know, trying to get seeds, you couldn't even get the seeds you needed because everybody was buying them up. Everybody was panicking, you know. Um, Yes, they were gone. Yeah. They were off the shelf. Seeds were gone. You could not find a seed yeah. on the shelf at the grocery It was store. that serious. People who I never thought would be gardening are, were like, all right, let me get these seeds real quick. <laughs> like, yeah, right? Stuff. Yeah, they're waking up. Wow. Yeah. So I, again, I want people to walk away feeling empowered like they can, mm-hmm. like, as, like they can do something and not feel discouraged because of where they live. And that's very sure. easy to happen. You know, again, folks may not may not know how to look into getting a local plot, you know, in their neighborhood to grow food for the summertime. You know, they may not um, think to ask about rooftop. I think about actually where I live. There's a whole rooftop. I'm sure it's not being utilized for anything. Um, So to to really tap into other resources that may like be very close to us, like where we live, I think is also another important thing, too, because now I'm just thinking like, what are they doing with the rooftop up there? They're not growing food. Maybe I can grow some food up there. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's I wanted to talk about that. And as the second uh, option for people, uh, rooftops, also ledges outside of your window are great places to grow food as well. It's like free real estate. I know a friend right now, actually, she lives in like a high rise apartment. And they have a garden on their rooftop. And what they did was they had the residents come together and have like a little garden team in the apartment building and they manage that space together. Um, my friend, I work also work at the National Arboretum with the Washington Youth Garden. And so I have a lot of garden friends and people who are very educated on how to grow food in pretty much anywhere. And um, so they kind of lead that team in the apartment building, but they're growing all kinds of stuff in there as well. Um, I also grew last year on a ledge um, using the square uh, garden method. Uh, Basically, that is a concept where you take a square foot and you kind of section off your garden bed into different square foot so you can grow multiple crops all at once. So I was growing callaloo, I was growing tomatoes, I was growing strawberries, I was growing sage, all kinds of just different things all in one little garden bed area. And uh, I had a, enough space right outside my window, out, right on a ledge to put an entire garden. Bed. Oh, wow. We yeah. need to see photos. Are there any on yeah. your Instagram page, y'all? Let's definitely, um, 
Yeah, scroll on the Instagram page. I could definitely. Let's go on up. Chris's Instagram page. Scroll a bit. Yes, you're going to have to scroll, but I want you all to see this. <clears> and I also want you all to follow Chris because if you all need any tips on growing indoors at your apartment or just in general, like go ahead and follow Chris. Y'all show me some grace because, and don't judge all of the <laughs> many um, uh, tabs that I, that I have going on. But I think. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen at all. Do you see Chris's Instagram screen? Can you guys still hear me? Let's see. No, they can't. Let me hmm. see. Okay, yes. No screen share. We can hear you, but no screen share. No screen share, you can hear me? All right, guys. I think I can, sh can I try sharing? See if that works? Um, You can try sharing. Yeah, you could try. Sorry, guys, I thought you'd be able to see. I'm trying to do this on the spot, thinking that, um, but y'all looking good. Okay, <laughs> sorry, y'all, I gotta, oh, you know, I think, Maybe for another time. I was going to say, I think I might know where I might have messed up, but actually, give me one moment. Let's try this again. Screen share. Can you all see now? <laughs> Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Can they see? I don't uh, see anything on my end. Do you want me to try real quick? I thought you guys would be able to see this. All right. Let me see. All right. Sorry, guys. I don't want to waste too much of your time, but I wanted you to see. But you have to go on Instagram. Chris's Instagram page is actually Afro underscore beats. And I love the richness of his feed. It is freaking amazing. You can see, and he also, he's also on TikTok as well. So if you wanna be engaged and entertained, go find him on, on TikTok because he has some pretty amazing um, videos there as well. Um, I don't see anything. See like, no, actually, let's see. Oh, we can see. Okay. Uh, all right. I think um let me know if you can see. I can explain what you're looking at. I can see. Okay. Uh, so this video in the beginning here, I'll like play it real quick. So this is a picture of like the a video of the balcony. Um, these are different things like spinach, some lettuce, uh, some collard greens. I'm growing right outside my window here, some herbs, and then basically putting on a little cooking demonstration there. But that's one example. So I only have three to six hours of sunlight on my balcony. So I focus on more shaded um, brassica crops. So like, you know, spinach, uh, collards, and plants in those families. Chris, uh, this is so awesome. Okay, I'm really jealous right now. All right, <laughs> so these are literally hanging on like the ledge of your patio. Like they're yep. somehow, okay, so they're attached. And so they're collard greens. What mm. else are you growing? Uh, collard greens, spinach. Uh, what else I got out there right now? I was playing around with some quinoa, kalu. Are you serious? Uh, a couple, of, yeah. This is what like, I'm talking about, y'all. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get... Uh, this one is a picture of last year. So this is on the rooftop, like right outside my window. Wow. So, uh, tomatoes coming in. I put a little trellis on the side. So for those climbing plants, I even grew a little uh, bean plant on the side. That um, is so trellis on both ways, uh, strawberries as well. I think there's even a better pair. Yeah, there's some strawberries right there. Okay, so Chris is coming over to my apartment when <laughs> to set up my balcony. Like, I appreciate you. As soon as you give me the call. Okay. I'm All down. right. There. Um, 
one question and let me know if you can say what resource do you use to determine what you can grow any websites books or just reading the seed packets that's a great question and i'm so glad that you asked that ray because what you had just mentioned that you only focus on like certain crops that i think grow more in like shaded areas is that correct Yes, just because that's what my space offers, but I grow um, full sun plants elsewhere. So there's a different, there's two different types of plants that are edible you can grow. You can either grow partial sun or you can grow full sun. What that means is the amount of light your plant needs to thrive. Some plants don't like to have six plus hours, eight hours of sunlight. Those are your cool weather plants. You know, like I was saying before, collards don't like necessarily too much heat. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, but basil, on the other hand, is a full sun crop that likes a lot of heat. Mint doesn't like too much heat, um, but it thrives in like three to six hours. So lead us. Okay, well, first, let's make sure we answer Ray's question about some resources. Yeah, I'm pulling up uh, one of. Uh, okay, so this is a good one. Uh, good author. Here we go. This is my favorite one right here. I've learned so much game from this book. This is how I started building those self-watering containers. It's called The Vegetable Gardener's Container Bible by right. Edward C. Smith. Absolute gem. Okay. That's a resource for you, Ray, and everyone else. Okay. You swear by this. <laughs> swear by it. Swear by it. I stole all my good stuff from him. <laughs> That's awesome. So Lita says she's in full sun. So okay, full sun. So sky's the limit. Uh, honestly, yeah. I mean, there's some things you don't want to put out in full sun, like I was mentioning before. Uh, it will say on the seed pack. Um, actually, I got a little. Uh, I got my seed box right here. So something. Here's a little pro tip to do. Uh, if you can find a recipe box and convert into a seat box that is definitely the move that's what this is so this right yes. here is open a, it up and like put it in the camera i, I think you. i've seen yeah, this sure. you've talked about this before yeah. yeah so this is a recipe box my mom had and my dad had since like the 70s or 60s and i took it and converted it into a seat box so when you open it there's a whole there's overflowing of the seeds in there so it's uh kind of like organized by the type of uh, you know, seed it is, you know, how it grows. Well, it it's organized to me. But <laughs> if you still like looking at it, they'll probably like in your eyes. It? So here, I just wanted to pull uh, something out just to kind of show you. All right. So Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, on the back of their seeds, they tell you everything you need to know in detail. So one thing you're looking for is the sun requirement. So this says uh, full sun, full sun for the light. So that means okay. this needs to be in a full area that's at least six to eight hours of sunlight. That's an example of that. Most uh, fruited vegetables, so I like to think of like watermelon, tomatoes, eggplants, anything that has like holds a lot of fruit or water is you're gonna need full sun for, so six to eight hours. Uh, leafy greens, herbs, that's when you're usually going to find your more three to six hours. Uh, Chris, are you telling me that I can grow watermelon in my apartment? Definitely. I've, I've seen people do it. Um, it's all about lighting and then strategy. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, you have to have a large cover area for a watermelon. You can actually grow watermelon vertically. It's It, it very much can climb a little bit as well. So... It depends on what the variety is. They also have a great tip for container gardeners, for tiny apartment gardeners, is to buy the baby or dwarf versions of certain plants. So something like eggplants can take up a lot of space, but I have this variety of eggplants called Little Prince. I think it's by Renee's Gardens. They called it, it's a dwarf eggplant. So basically instead of the full you know, eggplant, it's a, more like closer to a, a ball or like a tomato shape, hmm. but it's still an eggplant. And and some people don't even like eggplants like that. So if you're like, I want a little eggplant, but not too much, that's a perfect variety for you. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. So can I tell you, I never, I'm so glad you, Chris, first of all, Chris is like freaking hilarious y'all, but <laughs> you make a point. Not everybody likes eggplant. When I tell you, I never used to like eggplant. I was not an eggplant person 
unless it was like literally like fried and like dyed and like crispy eggplant, like delicious. Or I like the eggplant like really oily, like put all the oil in my eggplant, yeah. probably stuff that I don't need. Give me all the oil, season it very well, and I'm good to go. But I have to shout out my, uh, my aunt, shout out to Mississippi, who makes the most amazing like eggplant tomato stew. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with eggplant. Like I yeah. love eggplant. And um, I'm hoping that um, this is a plug for three part um, Harmony Farm in DC. I'm actually, I'm part of their CSA. And I think I've been seeing eggplant and I really hope that, that those have been hints of what I'm getting in a box tomorrow, but I could be wrong. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I think it's on the up and up. Honestly, eggplant is a great meat substitute. You could definitely kind of flavor it up and season it how you want to. I've seen people do some crazy stuff with eggplant. I know Tiff said, baby, love me some eggplant. I do too. <laughs> I love, I love, love, love eggplant. Let's go back to Ray. So what kind of pest issues do you run into and what do you do about it? Oh, gosh. So great question. One of the benefits of doing apartment gardening is you actually don't get nearly as many pests as you would if you were growing in ground somewhere. Um, I work at, the, like I said, the youth garden, and we're dealing with all kinds of stuff, raccoons, deers, uh, you know, beetles, all, ki all kinds of stuff. It's like a wild, you know, safari out there. <laughs> but <laughs> when you are dealing with pests in your garden, so let's take my balcony garden, for instance. Do I, the answer is yes, you do deal with pests just like anything. Uh, if you're inside versus outside, it might be different. Inside, you're probably dealing more with fungus gnats, which can be solved by making sure you're not overwatering and also getting sticky paper. It's just part of the game a little bit. Is like you may get you know fungus gnats here or there, but you can really mit like mitigate that by making sure you're doing the right things in the first place. And then outside, uh, me and the birds are uh, having a little beef right now because sometimes they like to take stuff. It depends on what they like. Some people, I think my next door neighbor, and we have, I live in a high rise apartment. They uh, have different levels where they're trying different things. I have gardeners above me. And then I have some people on the other side who are basically training birds. I don't know what's going on there. They have a whole bird feeder on their window and attracts birds. And then birds, when they're done feeding over there, they come and look, oh, what you got over there? What you got over there? And I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> but uh, birds one thing that's helped yeah, birds, when you're dealing with balcony gardens, because birds are like, oh, this is a city, like there's not much growing here, but there's something growing here. And your garden sticks up like a sore thumb. But one thing I did to uh, deal with the birds is I did a, uh, a row cover. So what happens when you're out of town, you're not really able to look at your garden and you want to make sure it's protected, just put a little uh, white row cover over it and just clip it with some like binder clips or something like that, you know? I love that training birds. I'm, I'm learning to make friends with the birds. I'm learning to like grow things that they might like, especially if they're great pollinators, like hummingbirds. Uh, I like to grow flowers that attract them as well. Cause that's just great for any garden. Um, thank you for asking that question, Ray, because um, one thing that I haven't thought a lot about, I, birds are the homies. Yes. Yes. What up, Jen? <laughs> An edible activist alum, shout out to Jen in the building, Whatever. Cleveland. Yes, but we don't, um, I'm so glad that she asked that question because when we think of pests, we don't just think of like, you know, the tiny like insects that could, yeah. you know, ruin your plants. I'm going through that right now. I'm like, what's going on with my plants? You know, like you, and I, there's a big tree right outside of my apartment, mm -hmm. literally, you know, yeah. so. The birds there on my on my little I, I ain't even a patio, y'all. I don't know what the heck it is. This is a <laughs> railing. There are no patios in DC. Uh, <laughs> unless you pay like thirty million dollars for one, right. but it's a railing, okay? But um, you know, I my, there's a big tree right outside my window. And so I keep my patio door open all the time. But you know, there are insects and they love your plants and they they love your herbs and they're like sitting right there. So that's actually a great question because we when we talk a lot about pests, when we do, we're talking about, you know, those pesty raccoons or, you know, the it's groundhogs, horrible. which shout out to Jennifer. She sent me a video of the groundhog all up in her greens the other day. <laughs> wow. You know, you talk about the worms, those little icky you know, gritty green things that latch on to, to your vegetables, but pest inside the home when it comes to like those little gnats, like that is a thing. And so, um, 
Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked that question. I saw another question. I did too. As well, got it. Yeah. Uh, for your leafy greens and herbs. First of all, what up, Joy? Is Joy? Joy, what up, Joy? Do you germinate indoors and then transfer outside? Great question. Yeah, I as much as I can start under grow lights, I do that absolutely because especially when you're growing in low light situations, a way to deal with avoiding leggy plants is to have strong plants as starters. Also, I when people are starting off with gardening or you have a low light situation, I always encourage people to just get transplants if they can and not worry about starting from seed. Because what happens is those plants have been cultivated to start off very strong and have a solid foundation. So when they grow in like difficult situations, they do that much better. I also encourage people if they are only growing through window and have that filter light coming in, definitely start it under grow lights. Don't try to start it in the window because it's a filtered light. They're gonna stretch for that light and it's not gonna be as strong as it would be for the sun. Good answer. <laughs> Appreciate it. So, Chris, you're question. coming. You're coming out with your 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 uh, tutorial on growing food in tiny spaces. When? Yes. Because I'm waiting. Very soon, actually. <laughs> um, so, when people get a hop off this, go head over to Afrobeats.org, and there's going to be um, a whole course that's coming out soon. Yes. So. Y'all hear? Y'all heard that? Was that exclusive right on Edible Activist? That's an exclusive food. drop on Edible Activist. Yes. Let me tell y'all. A lot of exclusive stuff has been dropped on Edible Activists, whether folks want to give me credit or not, okay? Because <laughs> I have interviewed some really dynamic people who have gone on to do some really great things. So it's been a lot of exclusive guests and advice. So, um, but we'll be looking out for that. That's actually what's up though. That really is. Yeah. Um, Cause even for someone like me, I do feel bad. I'm having a transparent moment. Like I have these beautiful plants, shout out to cultivate the city where I got my plants mm -hmm. from. I love them. Um, but I do know that I can be growing more indoors, but I now, I really do feel encouraged, um, Chris to utilize my ledge because you see other people doing it. And I've, so they're actually neighbors like around the corner. Like that's where their ledge is like lit, literally like yeah. lit, lit. So I want my ledge to be lit. Yeah. <laughs> Who I mean, else wants their ledge to be lit? I want mine to be lit. So when people walking by, they're like, oh, she's growing all sorts of yummy things out there. Yes, I am. Just don't come down. Uh, to door. We got to have ledges popping. Honestly, that's how we avoid avoid this crisis. You know, if everybody's growing a little bit here, a little there, not everybody has to grow everything. It's about community and figuring out, OK, you're growing sweet potatoes, you're growing collard greens, you're growing okra. Let's grow these things. Let's become masters of our own crops and then exchange with each other. And then growing our own food gets us more connected to the land. And that brings more value to the community gardens, to the, the farmers and the farmers market. You know, once you start growing one thing, you're like, all right, what else can I eat that's fresh, that's mm. cultivated with hands with of love, you know? And so people think, oh, when everybody starts growing their own food, you're not longer going to meet the farmer. And that's not true. It's the exact opposite. It's like you have a deeper appreciation for what they do and uh, how they cultivate the land. So yeah, it's super important. That was so beautifully said. Um, I do have to go back to let's get ledges popping. So okay. yes, let's shout out to ledges. Let's get our ledges popping. Um, but you're so right. And it's everything that you said is just really just spot on. Um, so again, I'm hoping that everyone listening feels inspired, feels encouraged um, to just grow something, especially if you're living in a very tiny space or maybe you're living in a home and your space is, you know, very tiny. You don't have much to work with, but there are folks who are working their spaces out. All right. Yeah. And um, the other point that you may you may, Chris, just it's about community. You know, I think back to you know, many conversations that I have with my with my grandmother, I got a shout out Grandma Catherine in Mississippi, um, who hails from Alabama. And, you know, she often, you know, we often have conversations about how community isn't like what it was when she was coming up because they made sure that their neighbors were fed. So, you know, it was really an exchange. It was an exchange of love and it was an exchange of food. 
and it was yeah. community coming together. And so you're right. Like, I don't need to, I can't grow everything, but you know, if I'm cultivating, um, you know, really great relationships with those around me and they're doing something like that as a community and there's an exchange there of food, love conversation. So we need more, more of that in this very weird, weird, weird world in times. Um, and even myself can do better, you know, but it's, it's weird out here y'all, but I'm grateful for folks like Chris, who I think has just been, like I said, like the strongest proponent has always pushed for like, you have the bare minimum, you can do something. So I appreciate all those tips. Um, we are gonna wrap up in just a few moments, so don't y'all go anywhere. If there are any other questions, go ahead and drop them in the, ch in the chat. Um, y'all have been so awesome. Thank you for loving up on me, loving up on Chris, this whole show. Um, but so what I learned, Chris, is that, you know, I need a pot some sun mm -hmm. or according to Ray, look at, G, look at the compass in my GPS, wherever the heck that is. Okay, Ray, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, and some water. I could potentially grow watermelons. I can grow an egg. Can I grow an eggplant? Absolutely. I, I grew can eggplant grow in the tomatoes window. in yeah. the window. Tomatoes. And let me just say, yep. and I know all y'all have had a homegrown tomato. When, once you've had a homegrown tomato, there's no going back. No. Can't stand tomatoes out of season anymore. It's yeah. like, it's not even the same. It's not even the same at all. Um, and what else? Give me a couple more things. Like, yeah. let, let us know what you've been growing, what you've grown. And then we're going to sure. wrap up. I did, I did want to give one more, because I think I've given you three technical ways to grow. And the last one is something new I've been kind of going on, is actually you don't need any space at all um, to grow food. You can actually grow on other people's property. Um, and something I've been really investigating and seeing what programs are out there. There's actually a lot of programs in the DC area that are available for people. Um, so right now I'm growing at this elementary school um, called Seaton Elementary. And I did it through a program that Aussie uh, put on. They have a nutritional program. And uh, basically um, it's called Shared Roots. Basically school gardens um, are the most underutilized spaces during the summer. Teachers are begging people to basically take over their gardens and maintain the gardens through the summer. And there's nobody really to enjoy it besides the community. And so what Aussie did was they created this program called Share Roots. People have community gardens, people have school gardens. It's like, hey, we need some volunteers. Can you help us? They get people from the community. It's like, hey, do you wanna grow here for the summer and maintain the garden? That's basically what I'm doing. I don't have full sun on my balcony. This is the least amount of space I think I've ever had and I'm still figuring out ways to grow outside of this so it's been incredible i wanted to give so three three ways you can uh grow on someone else's property and you should look into one is the community garden the community garden is the best spot for the starting off point for instance at the washington youth garden we have a rule if you if you uh you work you eat basically and not only that you also have like master gardeners who are basically working there so while you're working you're also picking up tips and tools and uh how to do everything and you're limiting your uh, your learning curve by like years by working at these community gardens. So that's one. Uh, school gardens, like I said, teachers are begging to get their kids outside in the garden, but they can't do that if the garden isn't maintained through the, the year. Um, so check out the Aussie program. If you get a chance, I think they'll do it next year again. And then last one, and I wanted to give a shout out to you and one of your podcast episodes, because I learned about churches. Churches are one of the most underutilized lands and is definitely desperately needed in those congregations. I want to shout out the um, Black Church uh, Food Security Network. Um, what they're doing over there is incredible and they're really building that network, that system, that community. So those are three ways you can grow food without even having space at all. So like I said, you just need the heart to go and, and seek those resources out pretty much. That is phenomenal. And yes, let's shout out Pastor Heber Brown, who is also an Edible Activist alum. I've had him on the show before. Thank you for referencing that episode. And I look forward to having Pastor back on because the amount of land of black of land at black churches combined is like crazy. And so he's been doing some incredible work, him and his team. Um, I believe our one of our during our last conversation that we had that they were working on just like this whole bank of documenting like how yeah. much land is available at black churches. 
And as someone who grew up going to a black church and mega church, okay, even more specifically, like those, th that land is not being used to grow food. And so I am so glad that you highlighted that. I definitely want to bring Pastor back on to unpack that more, but absolutely. So yes, yeah, so we have ways to grow food in our tiny little spaces. And if you have no space at all, so I appreciate that. Makes Absolutely. me just want to go knock on my neighbor's door and be like, can I get to your rooftop <laughs> and this girl a little something, something. So, yeah. Chris, where can folks, I dropped your IG in, um, yes. in the chat, but I want folks to be able to find you wherever you are, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all those yep. great places because they need to remain in touch and follow all the goodness that you're doing. Yeah, so uh, two main things. One, go to afrobeats.org, sign up for our mailing list. That'll give you all my social medias. That'll give you um, free information on how to start your own container garden at home. Um, and then next one is to check out the podcast, the Afro Beats podcast. It's on all streaming platforms. Melissa, I'm finally going to get you in there. You've already technically been on it, but I really want you on there for real, and we'll, we'll, we'll chop it up. But yeah, we're, we're kicking off the podcast. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I appreciate appreciate y'all for tuning in. Um, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, go to Food Talks and Color on YouTube and hit that subscribe button. Like this video. It makes a world of a difference. Share it. Um, I actually have over 100 subscribers now, y'all. I just launched YouTube, so I'm super excited cool. about this. Um, I have a goal. I want to hit that thousand mark. So, but every day, if you guys continue to share this great content, subscribe. If you haven't, please do so. So I appreciate you all. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Food Talks in Color. The Edible Activist Podcast is live on YouTube every other Monday. So the next show is going to be on Monday, July 25th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all right? So make sure to hit the notification button once I get this scheduled on YouTube and be there. So otherwise, Chris, I appreciate you. You're my friend. And I'm also going to be tapping you to come help me over my tiny space because I'm really I serious. And y'all hold me accountable. Ask me next time, Mel, what are you growing in your tiny space? Hold me accountable. All right? All right. Thanks, y'all. All right. Peace, y'all.